What does the law firm do when John Morgan goes into your market? Be better. Don't take it lying down. The common denominator for the most successful people that I know in my life is not that they were the smartest, is they were the hardest working. So you can actually work yourself to where you want to be. Well, John, thank you for being here. I want to start off just quite frankly, I know you don't do a lot of these things. Um, it's been a while. I mean, outside of probably LitaQuest, right? Probably not doing the conference tour. But when I asked you to join us, you said yes, no ask, unconditional, didn't ask for anything in return. Why did you agree to do this? When you fly all the way to Maui, Hawaii, to my house to ask me to do it, <laughs> how do you say no? There you go. All right, well, I want to kick things off um, for just a question. What percentage of the people in this room would you estimate hate your guts? Hate my guts? Just absolutely despise you. Uh, any that have met me, zero. To know me is to love me. Uh, I hope not because my, my thought about what we do is that rising tides lift all boats. And almost everything I have, I've learned from you all or somebody like you all. And I think when we help each other do better, we all do better. So... If they do, I hope they won't at the end of this hour. There you go. Well, and to put this in perspective, how big is, is the firm today? Number of lawyers, if you had to estimate number of cases, what does that look like? Uh, Morgan & Morgan, there's, there's 900 lawyers. There's 5,000 staff. We're looking to hire 150 lawyers right now nationwide. And uh, we're still growing. And I remember... At, you might not like me asking you this, but when I asked you about how many cases a month are coming in, I loved your answer. Well, what was my answer? You said, I have no idea. I really don't. It's probably, you know, it's, it's probably 1,500 injury cases a day. A day. And that does, you know, mass tort, not, not mass torts, not the other stuff. But it's a lot. And when it comes to marketing, I mean, I would, I would argue, perhaps objectively, that you may be the greatest legal marketer of all time if you're looking at just pure case acquisition. So I'm curious, in terms of when you're approaching a marketing campaign, whether it's Size Matters or some of the NIL deals or the UFC, like how do you approach that and how do you determine if something's a good idea versus a bad idea? Well, what we do is we have an entire creative team. Three times a month, we have a Zoom meeting with my creative director, the person who pulses cases every day, pulses what ads are running, my son Daniel, and a guy named Ruben Moskowitz. And during these creative meetings, we come up with what's going to be next. When we like an ad, when we like an idea, it goes like this. If, we see a, if I see something that would make me nervous as a competitor, I like it. Uh, yesterday, I had a Zoom call for creative, and they had an idea. The billboard was, Morgan gets more. Well, I, I didn't like that, because that would not have made me shiver as a competitor. Size matters. When I saw size matters, I loved it, and that would make me shiver. Why did I do size matters? Because we're the largest injury firm in America. We were going to do bigger is better. But that trademark was taken. Everybody thinks I went straight to Size Matters. I really was going to do bigger is better. And, uh, but when I did Size Matters, America's largest injury firm, when I saw that ad in concept, I said, that's an ad that I would not like to have to compete against. And so I went with that. There you go. And I want to talk about some of the NIL deals. So being able to get... Sports teams involved, players. I know here in local, Jordan Davis, who played for the Georgia Bulldogs, he's on a Size Matters billboard. He's, I think he's like 6'6", 340 pounds. 
But I guess, what, what are your thoughts on that? Has that been helpful in, in the local markets? We think so. In, in the beginning, it's getting crazy. I mean, we did a deal when it first happened. I was the first NIL advertiser. We won the award last year. And it was low-hanging fruit because these kids had never really been out there. They all now have agents. And the agents are getting a piece. And so it's getting more competitive. But we like the NIL because everybody loves their team. Everybody has a tribe they want to be part of, and it's, and it's local. Uh, I was up in Kentucky a couple of weeks ago with addressing the Kentucky basketball team. We're doing a big NIL deal with Kentucky and Calipari. So we like the NIL, but one of the kids who we did a deal with once, the next year he came back and said his agent said he wanted a million dollars for the next year. I said, no, thanks, but no thanks. Make a long story short, we ended up doing it for $10,000, not a million, but uh, you got to ask, you know, for the world. But so we like NIL, we like the fighting, the uh, fighting. We do, we got a big campaign in Boston with the Red Sox. We're in arenas. So more for top of the mind and just let the community know we're in your community. So I, I want to talk to you about, so when, when I visited with you, you shared a story with me on what ultimately may have been uh, one of the biggest blunders in the history of the legal industry. And when you came out of law school, um, you were working at a firm, and I would say perhaps they didn't have the growth opportunity that you wanted, which was the catalyst behind you going out and opening up your own law firm. If you can kind of speak to that experience. Well, the story I'll tell you is this. When I was a young lawyer, I went, only wanted to do personal injury. That's all I've ever done. I got a job in a personal injury firm, and I was doing very well. I was really, really good at getting business. I lived in union halls and union dive bars, which is also one of my specialties. And I was bringing in lots and lots and lots of business. So at the two and a half year point, they came to me to review me for the next year. And they gave me my review. And when they gave me their, my review, I was not happy. They were, they were here and I was thinking there. And so what I would tell you all is these moments come to everybody and it's like a fork in the road. And all of us have these forks in the road. So that day they told me what they thought I was worth. They told me, and I told them what I thought I was worth. And then they also told me there was, there was three guys in the firm that were ahead of me for partnership. And so I'm at the fork in the road. When you come to a fork in the road, you can do three things. One, take it, go straight. Two, go right, go, go somewhere else. Or three, go left and start your own thing. And so that was a fork in the road moment for me. And when I got to that fork, at the end of the meeting, they, were, they said, what do you think? And I say, well, and I went right to my office. I called some people that I'd been thinking about it with. And within a week, I'd started my own law firm. And so I didn't go straight. I didn't go right. I went left. And when, they, when I came back a week later to resign, they asked me, they said, why... Why is this happening? And I told him, I said, look, I told you what I, was, what I thought I was worth. You told me what you thought I was worth. For me to stay makes me one of the greatest BS artists in the world. And by the way, if I got to wait to be a partner ahead of, after these three guys, I'm just not going to wait. And so what I would say to everybody here you may be at a fork in the road right now. You might be at a place that's a dead end. Because when I looked straight ahead at that firm, I didn't see opportunity. I saw a dead end. And so what I would tell everybody here today, and you know if it's dead end. We all know. You, you know. Sometimes we don't want to admit it. But if it's dead end, you need to go left or you go to right. 
But if you go straight, you're going nowhere fast. So how do you handle this in your firm? Because I imagine you've got some stars, some really high performers. They, I imagine they've come to you in a similar situation. How, how do you approach that? Well, I have some partners. There's, there's two ways to, to handle people. Uh, partnership points or just money. And both work. The only people that I want to give partnership points to is somebody, some person, who's going to continue to enlarge the pie, to make the pie bigger. But then you have performers who I give them benchmarks, and every time you hit a benchmark, you get paid. The one thing at Morgan & Morgan is there are no, there's no such thing as a discretionary bonus. You do what you do, and then you turn in your worksheet, and you get paid. There's no end of the year where I go, hey, by the way, here you go, Mike, because I don't think that works. And, and the firm can have a bad year, and you had a good year, and you don't get a good bonus. So all of our people, they know with certainty, and they get paid every single month. We don't wait to the end of the year to come in and go, hey, here's a hundred grand, here's a million dollars. They can build that million in the year. And as the year goes on, their bonuses go up. And so I think that has been uh, my approach. And in your book, Can't Teach Hungry, in the book you make a pretty clear case for the fact that hunger, this insatiable desire to win, it, it can't be taught, you're born with it. How do you evaluate somebody when you're either meeting with them, whether it's a lawyer or a member of your team? How, do, how can you tell if they've got it or not? Now, one way I tell, I used to tell, I can't tell anymore. Whenever I meet somebody, I always ask what they did as a kid. Uh, when people used to tell me they were a paper boy, I knew I had a winner there. I knew that person had a seed from birth. Because paper boys, those are some working sons of bitches. It's morning, every morning, every weekend, rain, sleet, snow. Or I'll hear that they did something. They had a lawn business, they sold grit, they did something early. Because I believe that we are born with certain things. And one of those things is drive. Uh, Warren Buffett was a paper boy. Oprah Winfrey was a paper girl. If I went through it, I could tell you, I meet people my age, I'll just say, like I was at Keeneland for the races a few weeks ago. I said to this one guy, I said, were you a paper boy? He goes, how'd you know? You know. It's, it's, it's like, you know, black light, you can tell. But I look for that early on, and then, but there's no secret, because I have hired people that I thought, this is it. This is the one. The look, the personality, the charisma. But sometimes these people are lazy. And they like to sit around in the morning and watch Sports Center and eat uh, cereal. And you, you don't know. And look, everybody makes mistakes. Look at the draft choices in the NBA and the NFL and Major League Baseball. There's a lot of first rounders that bust. You only really know once you get in the trenches with them, watch them work day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and then those people emerge. And, it's, and it becomes obvious. Now, something that may not be obvious that you share with me is that even with a thousand lawyers, you mentioned that today you have primary non-lawyers running the firm. What, what was the thought behind that? I guess what kind of led to, to that decision? Well, I had a dinner one time with the firm uh, Simmons. They do asbestos work. And we had a dinner. They came to Orlando to meet me. And, but they had a whole team from the Simmons law firm, but very few of them were lawyers. They were people who ran the firm. And I was intrigued by that. I spent more time talking about their structure than about mesothelioma. And 
I said, you know what? All these law firms believe that we have to have a lawyer as the manager or the co-manager. And why is that? And so after that dinner, and as I've progressed, I would say that my, the top part of my team that runs my business are all non-lawyers. And as we move more and more in technology, I mean, I've got a lot of people, a lot of non-lawyers making seven-figure salaries that I've hired from Google and Shave Club and national advertising agencies, call centers. And so the people who actually run my firm, very few lawyers and mostly people with very specific skill sets. I don't know the intricacies of a call center, but Angie does. And Angie has 200 people in El Salvador answering the phone. She's got 600 people in Orlando answering the phone. And that's what she does. She teaches me. And so you got to just realize that just because you're a lawyer and it's a law firm doesn't mean that the business side has to be run by lawyers who in many cases are not good business people and have other things to do. The people, the non-lawyers that work for us, they have one job and it's, that's what they do every day. And when you're growing, you're just across the country, you're looking to invest in another firm, expand the firm, um, acquire a firm. What, what are the things you're looking at in, in those law firms? How do you evaluate whether that's, you know, that makes sense for you or not? I don't like the idea of acquiring firms. I've got a guy, a broker right now after me trying to get me to buy a firm in um, Tennessee for $8 million and it's a legacy firm. But, you know, to buy a firm, you really just buy an inventory because once you buy that firm, and I don't want, and I want my own brand, but when I do, but when I have bought a firm, I'm not really buying that inventory. I'm trying to get that team on my team. When Warren Buffett buys a company, he doesn't move new people in. It's a requirement that the, the team stays. So when I got into first party in a real big way years ago, I acquired a firm called the Nation Law Firm. I didn't care about the Nation Law Firm. I cared about Mark Nation and his team. So I'm not an acquirer of law firms. I'd rather take this guy that wants to sell me his company for $8 million in Tennessee. I think, hey, I could go in with $8 million in Knoxville. And it would be a tsunami. I couldn't spend it. And uh, so I'm not a buyer necessarily of law firms. And what do you think is the greatest threat to lawyers and law firm owners these days? Is it competition? Is it technology? Well, the greatest threat to, to, to law firms, it's three things. But actually, one other thing. It's technology. It's regulation, tort reform and it's competition. Uh, technology, smarter cars, red light cameras, but technology also cuts the other way because people are in the smarter cars talking on their phone. Regulation, you can't really, tort reform, you can do your best at the state governments, but we've all seen everybody here from Texas and places like that and Florida, we've had our practice areas gutted and the rights of individuals stripped away in favor of the insurance industry. And then competition. I mean, competition is the, the main threat. Who's going to work harder than you? Who's going to get up every day? But I think the greatest threat to your business is you. Because people become fat and happy, lethargic, you get to a certain plateau, and for a lot of people, a certain number is, is, is it. And they stop growing, and they don't have that drive. And their business starts to collapse underneath them, but they don't really see it 
until the whole bottom falls out. So the key thing is to look at yourself and say, do I have the energy to do this? And if I don't, let's go get some people who do. But the greatest threat to all of our businesses is us, our energy, our drive, and our hustle. So speaking of that, how do you keep your fire burning? I mean, would it be fair to say that this year, Morgan & Morgan will do probably at least a billion dollars in fees, and you've got a great team, but you're still, on, you're still in the marketing meetings, you're still, you know, obviously engaging with the leadership team. How do you stay hungry? You know, it's, I'm competitive. If you go to our website and look at our verdicts just this year, I mean, I will get more verdicts in America, plaintiff verdicts in America, than anybody, by a long shot. If you go to our website, forthepeople.com, you'll see our offers and verdicts. Every week we get million dollar verdicts. But the way I stay hungry is I understand what I can and cannot do. One of the hardest things to do for a founder or a partner is to begin the process of letting go and to begin the process of transition. Most of us, we, we retire, we shut the door, and we get nothing for our business. So as I'm getting older, I know I don't look that old, but as I'm getting older, I realize what I can do. It's like athletes. I mean, I'm watching LeBron James. I'm like, hey, this dude may be, you know, you, we know Russell Westbrook. I mean, there's a time basically does this. And you can let that happen and just sink with the ship, or you can do what I'm doing is to plan a strategy of rebirth, reinvigoration. I've got three sons that are lawyers. I've got a very good group of people around me. And so I have my vision and then I have my methods to execute my vision. And they all have benchmarks that they get paid on. This keeps them hungry. And so I don't have to work the way I did. I tell people it's almost like in the beginning when I'd go to war, I had to go to Afghanistan you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now, they fight wars over at Tampa at MacDill Air Force Base. The general sits there like, boom. Well, Osama bin Laden's dead. Let's, let's go to Carabas. And so I'm kind of fighting the war from MacDill Air Force Base, punching the drone button and then going to Carabas for lunch. <laughs> so the first book, you can't teach hungry. The second one, you can't teach vision. I don't know if you're open to giving people a sneak peek. You mentioned the thought around doing a third book. And I remember when we did our, uh, even the, the first podcast, you, you talked to me about life is luck. You mentioned this, this 3 a.m. phone call you got very early in, in your career, if you could speak to that. What I believe more than anything is that 99% of all of our success is luck. Now, most people push back hard on that. You know, I bet Joe would. Because Joe would say, by God, I worked my ass off. But what I would say to Joe is this, I know you did. But today, two mules will be born. One will be a hard-working mule who can plow eight hours a day and have a bountiful field. And the other just won't work. Genetically, just won't work. That hard-working mule didn't do anything but be born. Today, a lion will be born and it's king of the jungle. And a sloth will be born and screwed. And neither one of them did anything except they were born. So, yes, Joe Freed is a hard worker.
But I bet you Joe Freed, I have no idea. I bet you he was something like a paper boy. I don't know. But I would bet in his history, there's something. And so once you realize that it's not all you, then you hope that that luck comes along. When that luck comes along, most people waste luck. When luck comes along, you have to take that luck and get a return on luck. You get a return on investment, get a return on luck. The case you're talking about, when I was young, before I went to law school, I sold yellow pages. I was friend with a guy. His wife was a nurse. One night I get a call at 3 a.m. in my home from his wife. The guy had been paralyzed. They were looking for a lawyer. I get up out of bed. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. I get up out of bed. I'm in there, you know, head and shoulders and strapping up and walking out the door at 3.30. My wife's like, what are you doing? I'm going to sign up this case. Now, I got that case, you know, luckily, because I knew Jim Gomez and Jim's wife was Tricia and she was a nurse. That's all I did. I just, I sold yellow pages and this case came. But I have a philosophy about business, and that is fish first and fish fast. Because if you don't, the fish will not always be biting or somebody else will get the fish. So when my wife said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to go, I'm going to go sign this case up. And she said, why don't you wait till seven? Well, the fish could be gone. And I got up and I walked out and I'm walking out of that hospital about five o'clock with the client signed up. By morning, I had the estate set up and by afternoon, I had the lawsuit filed. And in less than a year, I settled it for, for me was gigantic, millions and millions and millions of dollars. That was luck. Then I took that luck because I got up to go fishing and by the way, fish usually bite the best before dark. And then I took that money, and that's when I took that money and went into advertising. And I moved that money over here. A lot of people buy a boat with that money. I bought into my future. In that case, David Vega versus Key Capital Leasing, that return on that luck is what I look back on. What I would have been without that, I don't know, but it was a hell of an accelerant for me. If anyone's ever emailed you, they get an email back, you've got a very simple email signature, and it says, there's a quote, it says, faith without works is dead. That's just a personal thing for me. I, you know, when I was younger, I used to go every once in a while to daily mass and when I'd go to daily mass, everybody was like 70 and above at the daily mass. I think, and I used to think, why is there no young people here? I think when you get closer to the end, you, you get closer to God. And faith without works is just a message to myself that we can talk a good talk, but if we don't actually do something for others, uh, then it's just all talk. And I try not to talk about what I do because there's another scripture in Matthew 6 that says when you brag on what you've done on earth, it's undone in heaven. But that's just a reminder to me to keep my focus on what is important. And what's important to me is not that I believe 100% there's a God because I have doubts all the time. I mean, the my number one prayer is to pray for more faith to believe in God more. But I want to lead my life exactly as if there will be a God because if I'm wrong and don't do that, it could be a very, very long, everlasting life. <laughs> and, and regardless of anyone's perception of you, if people could take one thing away from this conversation... What do you think that should be? Well, what I, what I would say to people is, um, first of all, 
I've always said grow or die. And people always, what does that mean, grow or die? I believe that you got to all, Joe Biden says, if you're not going up, you're going down. That's another way of saying it. So I've always had a, as a mantra, grow or die. And a lot of times we think we're growing to get more, but sometimes we're growing just to stay in the same place. And years ago, I had a big, big nursing home practice. It was, it was 25% of all of my fees. And then all of a sudden, tort reform came in and wiped it out overnight. And I was just growing to stay where I was. Sometimes you're growing not to go here. You're growing just to stay where you are. And it's grow or die is the thought about, you know, trying to be number one, which is hard. That's why I love Nick Saban so much. I, I love any, that's why I love Tom Brady so much. Anybody that can win and then stay on top. Um, so grow or die would be one. And then I would just say, personally, is this. Do what you say you're going to do. Do what you, just very simple. I've never been sued. I've never sued anybody. I've walked away from relationships where other people were suing other people for money. And what I decided when that happened to me is I just said, you know what? And those people sued and won the money. I didn't get it, but I said, you know what? I would rather just go do my own thing. Litigation is stressful enough. If you're in it yourself, that's really negative, negative energy that takes an inordinate amount of time. So I would just say two things. Do what you say you're going to do. A handshake should be a contract. Show up on time. Doesn't cost anything to be on time. And then as I say to everybody, when they'll come in and say, do we still have a deal? I say, a deal's a deal. And by that, do what you say you're going to do. There you go. All right, let's give it up for John. All right.